Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Jim Kaplan, founder and owner of AuditNet, and I'll be moderating the webinar. Today's webinar is Training Without Travel, and it deals with converging ethics, governance, and culture. Joining us is Michael Brosetti, president of Boundless LLC, and he will be covering the, the topic today. Uh, before we have Mike introduce himself, let me cover some of the housekeeping items. I believe that's the next slide, Michael. Thank you. Okay, today's webinar and its material are the property of AuditNet and Boundless LLC. Unauthorized usage or recording of the webinar or any of its material is strictly forbidden. We are recording the webinar and you will be provided access to that recording within two to five business days after the webinar is over. Downloading or otherwise duplicating the webinar recording is expressly prohibited. We kindly request that everyone fill out the brief online evaluation questions that you'll see at the conclusion of the webinar. Your feedback is very valuable, so please take a minute or two to complete the survey. In addition, because this webinar qualifies for CPE credits, we will be putting up polling questions in compliance with NASBA rules and standards. Those answering the questions will receive their CPE certificate by email within seven to ten business days. You will have an opportunity both during and at the end of the webinar to ask questions. Submit your questions during the presentation via the chat window at the lower right hand box on your screen. Type your question and press return to send it. Any question we're unable to answer by the end of the webinar, we will answer via email directly within 48 hours. As moderator, I will be launching the polls showing the results and monitoring the questions. I'd now like to turn the floor back to Michael and have Michael introduce himself and give you a brief overview of his background and introduce the agenda for the webinar. Michael? Thank you, Jim. And again, welcome everyone to today's webinar uh, on converging ethics, governance, and culture. Uh, for those of you that are joining us uh, again, um, we've already in uh, our previous webinars covered the topics of the value of internal audit as well as uh, the business of fraud and occupational abuse. And both of those programs really took an inward, uh, in, in a in, internal outward view of auditing and, and the concepts of uh, fraud risk. Um, this program really takes a uh, external view looking in. Um, which is which is an exciting program topic. Um, my background and experience comes from both the external audit world as well as the internal audit uh, industry as well. Um, I've been a consultant for the past uh, going on seven years, uh, seven years now, and one of the interesting um, engagements that um, that I've worked on and that really I think emphasize um, and build upon this topic uh, of ethics, governance, and culture was being engaged and involved with a state institution uh, pension fund um, on a governance research project and seeing some of the um, some of the convergence of these topics really at the level of uh, not only um, the governance level of organizations but when you're looking at many 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 organizations and trying to understand uh, the governance uh, aspects of them. Um, what I really uh, came what came to light for me was just how important and how interchangeable um, these terms of ethics, governance, and culture really are uh, in the in the practice of internal audit, as well as just from a business uh, and operational perspective in the business. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, sharing my insight uh, to the extent it will be beneficial to the group. Um, as Jim mentioned, uh, please, if you have questions uh, as we go through today's uh, webinar, please feel free to use the chat window. And um, we'll also reserve some time at the end to address questions as, as well. Uh, we do highlight some key facts uh, as part of this webinar. Um, but of course, in addition to some of the facts, there's also going to be some views and opinions that are expressed uh, during the webinar. Uh, I'll take full responsibility for those as president of Boundless LLC. Um, and they may not necessarily represent uh, either the opinions of AuditNet uh, or any other association referenced herein. Uh, we do reference some of the uh, Institute of Internal Auditing uh, 
auditors and standards. Um, most most of us are probably familiar with those. Um, and what I try to do is really bring together not only a, a fresh new perspective to the uh, topics of ethics, ethics, governance, and culture, but really uh, try to create that connecting point to uh, professional standards that are available that are going to help us as internal audit practitioners, uh, as compliance and risk um, professionals, uh, really be able to provide t uh, the assurances that our organizations might be seeking. Uh, but what I've learned is it's always good to understand uh, the perspectives of your stakeholders, uh, whether it be regulators, board, uh, board of directors, um, as well as your executive leadership. So we're really going to cover a lot uh, today, and we're going to get into that uh, by doing a quick review here of what today's learning objectives are. Um, some key terms that we've seen uh, time and time again transparency, accountability, risk oversight. Uh, these are not new terms. We've all heard them. Uh, one, of the, one of the key things we'd like to see everyone get out of today's uh, seminar is really get, a, again, that fresh perspective and gain some insight on how you, as an internal audit function, as a risk manager, as a compliance professional, can help drive these initiatives. And what does it mean in the context of ethics, governance, and culture? Uh, transparency and accountability and risk oversight. Um, at the end of the day, what is really important, and I think uh, when you're an internal audit practitioner, you might not always think in this context. That's why I like to talk about it as part of this webinar. Um, but these terms um, are terms that we oftentimes see uh, at the as what the responsibilities are of our directors and officers of our corporation. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the executive leadership team. We're talking about the independent board to the extent one, uh, one, one uh, is in existence, and their fiduciary duties. Now, uh, the notion of fiduciary duty um, in every legal system in every country is going to be different. But some of the fundamental and underlying principles are the same. Um, if you're a director or an officer, you have some type of prescribed duty to that organization. Now, in the US context, when we speak of fiduciary duty, what we're really talking about are the duties of care, the duties of loyalty, and the duties of prudence to that organization. Um, and I think when you talk governance, you know, in, in this webinar, we're going to get a little flavor of you know, understanding some of the legal governance aspects as well as the ethical governance aspects of what governance really means. Um, what we really do as internal auditors um, need to have that basic understanding of that fiduciary duty, who has them within our organization, and what does it mean. So simply stated, it's these duties of care, loyalty, and prudence um, that the directors, that the officers of the organization um, have a responsibility. Um, they have a responsibility to uh, their investors if they're a public corporation. Uh, if they're in the government sector, um, these duties might be owed to the general public, um, what is oftentimes referred to as a public trust. Um, so if you're in the government uh, sector, uh, again, the principles of this fiduciary duty um, do exist, but again, the context is a little bit different. Another key learning objective is looking uh, and gaining insight on how to actually audit ethics and business conduct. Um, the Institute of Internal Auditors has recognized, and this came out in one of their position papers um, probably about two years ago now, uh, where they've talked about the, uh, the, the prospective future of the internal audit profession, um, but they also were prudent in recognizing that there were some gaps, and there were some gaps in terms of where do we need to better improve uh, uh, direction for internal auditors on a worldwide basis? And what I found really interesting out of that reading is the, the top three um, areas that were noted in this particular piece of literature talked about um, how to audit ethics, um, how to audit strategy uh, was up there in the top three, as well as how to implement enterprise risk management. And I think those three topics um, are, are certainly on the forefront of internal auditors' agendas these days, uh, or they're, they're starting to become on the forefront of their agendas. And part of today is uh, going to be sharing, and again, 
uh, providing the group a framework in how you can, in fact, audit ethics and business conduct. And I like to say that this approach that we'll talk about uh, really is um, it, it audits the effect. Um, so I want to show you a cause and effect model when it comes to uh, ethics, governance, and culture that I, that I hope will resonate and really give you new ideas and new insight on how you can approach this. Because at the end of the day, the idea here is how do you develop an early warning system? Um, that's one of the key learning objectives is it's great to have a whistleblower hotline. Um, it's great to you know have someone report this massive fraud and corruption within your organization. But part of the insight that we want to gain today is really you know challenging the the ethical uh, aspects, the cultural aspects, the softer governance aspects of the organization to to try and develop this early warning system so that things don't get out of hand, things aren't getting to the point of um, you know major catastrophes and um, and disasters. Um, you know, it's easy to identify red flags. The tougher question is, you know, how do we detect and respond to these yellow flags? And how many yellow flags uh, should really caution us, or how many yellow flags does it take to make a red flag? So we're looking at this from the, the, the softer and more subjective governance perspective. And lastly, we want to um, learn methods to quickly identify non-compliance, deficiency, weaknesses, mismanagement, fraud, and corruption. Um, again, the tools and the framework that um, we're going to share with you today are, is really something that can be leveraged in, in all of these areas. And we're going to show you just how you can do that as part of today's webinar. Um, the, the topics uh, that we'll cover uh, with respect to these learning objectives is introducing this notion of cultural risk. Um, this is a term that uh, really first came across. I think I was in a, it was a, one of the social media sites where the Institute of Internal Auditors started asking questions about cultural risk in one of their discussion forums. And I thought it was such an important, uh, important uh, concept that I've done my own research and wanted to expand on this. Uh, if anyone follows the uh, the investor Warren Buffett, um, he'll be the first one to tell you that the rule book doesn't dictate behavior in an organization. It's the organizational culture. Um, so that's a pretty powerful concept coming from someone who knows uh, knows about risk, knows about investing in organizations, to really make that bold statement that culture is such an important aspect of what drives behavior that sometimes we have to look beyond just those policies and procedures and the quote rule book, as Warren Buffett uh, stated in, uh, uh, I believe this was uh, in one of his uh, congressional testimonies uh, post the financial crisis. Um, we're also going to take a look at some case studies on ethics. I mean, I think sometimes the best way to really highlight and emphasize some of the, uh, the, the risks when we talk about ethics, when we talk about governance and culture, um, is to highlight them through case studies. I'm going to walk you through a couple of those um, as well. Um, some of them might be familiar to you. Uh, some of them might be new, uh, so we'll have a mix of uh, mix of case studies there. Um, talking and distinguishing uh, between the difference of values, principles, and ethics, um, these are terms that I think sometimes we use interchangeably, um, and that's not necessarily the case. I want to bring a fresh perspective of understanding um, really how to with some of the similarities and differences between these terms and their their key relationships. Uh, again, we're going to cover this idea of fiduciary duty um, and board oversight. Uh, I've learned that one of the best ways we can really address some of these topics of ethics, governance, and culture is appreciating that perspective of uh, the, our board members that those fiduciaries of the organization are going to have. Um, we're going to get into talking about governance system elements and then uh, the framework that I had shared and really one of the key takeaways is you know, how do you assess the quality of what I'm going to call the ethics compliance system. Um, and that's a term that I'll elaborate upon uh, as we go through uh, as we go through today's webinar. Um, but I, I, I tend to have a tendency and I think most internal auditors do to view, uh, view things in terms of systems. So when, when you talk about uh, governance systems uh, and the human aspect and the human behaviors associated with that, what we're really talking about is this notion of an ethics compliance system. So some key things on what we're going to cover today here. 
this was the question um, that frankly sparked a lot of my interest in this topic. Um, again, I think this question was asked in the uh, one of the the Institute of Internal Auditors discussion blogs, and they asked the question of uh, is there a culture of risk? So they they sort of threw this philosophical question out, and there was a variety of uh, internal auditor responses. There wasn't that many actually. But there was a variety of responses on, you know, is there this culture of risk? And as risk managers, as experts in internal control, I think this is a question that really makes a lot of sense for us to uh, really take a deep consideration of, um, especially within our own organizational uh, context. And the way that I, I responded to this, um, and you'll see the, the quote up here, um, is taking the notion of culture. When you think of culture, uh, outside of an organization, well, what do you mean when you talk about um, the culture of uh, or history of um, your family, your descendants, your ancestry? Well, what we're talking about are behaviors, beliefs, and values that get passed along um, to generation to generation. And this is passed on through communication and imitation. So from a, from a non-business perspective, from a non-organizational perspective, I think we all can have an appreciation on how culture travels throughout time, uh, throughout generations, so to speak. Uh, and I think there's a lot of truth to this conveyance of behaviors, beliefs, and values at the organizational level. But I think we see it in a couple of different ways, or at least we see it in two dimensions. One, you, of course, over time, similar to the uh, um, the the ancestry culture you'll see uh, organizations uh, over time um, and, and um, uh, attrition so the removal and hiring of new people etc uh, over the long uh, over a long horizon or a long timeline you're going to see culture passed on but we also have to look at it in the perspective of uh, the hierarchical levels um, and if you're a large organization that has um, uh, subsidiary um, organizations, I call it the parent-child relationship, but you have to consider these as well. And I think why this is a, a, such an important additional dimension to introduce when you talk about cultures of risk is you're, you're going to find that um, there's potentially going to be um, well, one fact is every organization is going to espouse to wanting some form of culture, uh, whether that's documented and communicated via its code of ethics, its value statements. But the reality is those might not be espoused at all levels of the organization. So you have this risk of um, is there going to be these risky subcultures somewhere within the organization. We have to take into account these um, hierarchical and these uh, what I call parent-child relationships that exist in the organization because they're all very relevant to uh, to cultural risk. Uh, <laughs> you know, one of the and this comes back to uh, why I think uh, ethics, governance, and culture are really such important and and, and converging terms, so to speak. Um, this was uh, something uh, that I had uh, thought that I'd shared on uh, one of the, the Institute of Internal Auditor blogs. It was subsequently published in their Internal Auditor magazine. Um, and what I, was, what I intended to do here was really raise the importance and raise the emphasis on why it's important for internal auditors to focus on these uh, concepts of ethics, uh, governance, and culture. Um, with, from, a, from a perspective of um, the fundamental, so to speak, uh, definition of internal auditing. And for those of you that uh, are familiar with the, the IIA's uh, definition of internal auditing, it ends with talking about how we're supposed to improve governance, risk, and control processes, systems. And what I challenge here is if we don't take a look, and we're not looking at the um, uh, area of governance, um, that the challenge with that and the problem with that is that if we spend too much time looking at these risk management and the internal control systems 
and we're not taking enough time or spending enough time looking at governance is that we very well might uh, might be in a position where we're providing assurances that just might not be so. Um, the uh, Another popular expression uh, that, uh, that I think um, follows this pretty well is one that says um, internal control effectiveness uh, will never rise above the integrity and ethics of the people who create, administer, and, and, and monitor the internal control system. So we're very much talking about those people elements of governance, the people components of uh, ethics, and the people components of uh, culture. Um, so a very people-oriented uh, exercise. So I thought that would be uh, helpful um, to at least share with you some of the background on uh, why uh, you know why I have the view of uh, these three terms being such a, an important aspect of internal auditing, and frankly, how we can go about um, under, not only understanding the convergence of these important topics, but again, leaving today's webinar with a framework to gain some assurances around them. Um, some other research, preliminary research that I wanted to share with you, um, you know, I went out and I asked the question, um, and this was in a variety of audit risk management and compliance blogs, uh, and I asked the question of what speaking topics interest you most? Um, and as you see here, uh, the topics of ethics and culture didn't get a very good response. Um, the, the, the topic uh, from a speaking perspective didn't highlight, didn't resonate with a lot of people. Uh, interestingly, uh, I did another survey. Uh, this had about 230 votes. Again, in similar, uh, similar groups uh, I, I tested, I asked the question of, do you think corporate culture has an impact on financial performance? And the majority of folks said yes. And this was one of my aha moments because I thought to myself, as an internal auditor, um, we have such an opportunity here to address culture um, because it does have such an effect and impact on our financial performance as an organization, yet most people don't really want to talk about it. Uh, they don't want to hear about these cultural and ethical aspects, uh, topics. Uh, within our organization. So that was my conclusion to uh, these two quick polls, which I thought were uh, pretty telling and said, hey, there's an opportunity here to uh, really explore this uh, notion of ethics, governance, and culture, and how we can converge these topics, uh, and how we can gain the types of assurance that uh, our organizations uh, might be looking for um, uh, when they look at internal auditors uh, with respect to their governance duties um, to the organization. And that's a little bit of background on the notion of converging uh, ethics, governance, and culture. Um, and before we move on, uh, we're going to ask our first polling question. So Jim, if I can turn things to you um, and ask everyone to take this quick polling question, uh, then we'll carry on. And these are required for everyone uh, in attendance today uh, who's attending live to get their CPE cert, uh, certificates. Okay, it looks like we had 100% of the votes rolling in, and we hit 83% of uh, our respondents, say 96%, and that's absolutely right. Um, as you see, overwhelming majority here uh, saying culture affects financial performance. Um, as a deeper dive in some of the subsequent questions around this topic, uh, what I found interesting in some of the freeform commentary is folks brought up, the uh, practitioners brought up the fact that this can be both a positive and a negative um, thing uh, in terms of financial performance. But nonetheless, there was definitely a, a, a relationship uh, between culture and financial performance. And we'll talk about some of those uh, differences, uh, so to speak, 
um, in some of our, our case study examples. So great, good job. Looks like the majority of us uh, nailed that one. Uh, so let's first start uh, talking about ethics. And here's where we get into um, the, the first leg of the stool, so to speak, uh, and really examining some, some case studies. Uh, and the first case study, um, and again, I tried to select a, a wide variety of international organizations here. Um, if um, this was reported through Fox News, uh, if anyone remembers or recalls the uh, the Satyam Computer Services um, debacle, uh, this was known as the Enron of India. Um, unbelievable uh, reporting issues here. Um, essentially, there was a billion dollars um, in declared revenue uh, at the uh, that was fraudulent. That was just non-existent. Um, PwC was the was the uh, external auditor here, and typically when these types of uh, debacles happen, the, you know obviously the external auditors um, are uh, are uh, uh, investigated uh, as part of this. And when you when you peel back the layers of uh, the layers of the onion in this case, what was fascinating and the way that the the organization was able to to get away with this for so long um, was that the CEO. Uh, essentially, had um, had uh, been the sole point of contact for producing any type of financial statements for the external auditors. So, uh, again, from an auditor's perspective, um, you know, probably not the best practice, not being able to independently verify and validate documentation, um, but by the CEO having the sole access and being able to produce. Um, that documentation to the external auditors, um, they were able to fool them and fool a lot of external stakeholders as well uh, into their true financial position uh, with respect to their revenue. Um, good lesson learned for us internal auditors. Um, you know, trust but verify. Um, make sure you have that independent source uh, when you're when you're relying on uh, uh, on receiving information from uh, from management. One billion in you know essentially fictitious declared revenue. Um, when we talk about the cultural aspects of, so as you can see here with the CEO being involved in this, um, you know there was you know th there was a, a wrong tone at the top, um, and when you find this uh, tone at the top, whether it's good or it's bad, whether the tone is good or the tone is bad, you're going to see it pervasively affect and filter down through the organization. We talked about that hierarchical generation to generation type uh, concept of culture. Well, here's a perfect example as uh, the CIO, we could presume he's probably a number two level to the chief executive officer. Um, you know, further allegations for wrongdoing here. Um, you know, he was essentially ousted for, for buying um, uh, preferred stock options from Satyam. Now, the CIO in this case is actually the CIO of one of the uh, Satyam computers um, uh, customers. So there were people internal of to, to Satyam um, computers who was essentially being complicit in this scheme where the bank CIO, uh, who was a customer, who was a client, was giving all of this business to Satyam computers in the meantime taking advantage of uh, getting these preferential stock options. Um, and he was solely responsible for awarding Satyam these major contracts. Um, the bank here was the World Bank. Uh, you know they're a pretty large uh, global organization, um, and there was um, interestingly, uh, and again on that note of culture, uh, there was additional allegations um, here. Uh, again, at a different level, where um, not only uh, was Satyam alleged of all this financial wrongdoing, but there was even more pervasive uh, issues with. Um, uh, data heists of uh, sensitive information uh, from their customer, uh, again being the World Bank large financial institution. Um, so you know you can certainly I think see in this example that when you have the uh, when you have the top um, who might not be doing the right thing, uh, there really is a cultural risk that's going to filter down uh, throughout all levels of the organization. Uh, good example of ethics gone wrong. Um, New Century Financial is another uh, interesting case study. Um, this was uh, uh, 
post-financial crisis, or I should say during the financial crisis, um, New Century was a provider of home loans. Um, and they really focused on providing home loans to people with poor credit. So you can imagine the, you know, the, the, the exposure they had uh, during the financial crisis. Um, they ended up filing for bankruptcy um, because their loans uh, that they were providing their customers were just in massive, massive, massive uh, defaults. Um, external auditors, who at the time were KPMG, uh, you know, had a lawsuit initiated uh, against them. This lawsuit was initiated by the trustees of New Century. Um, and uh, when we talk about this theme of uh, culture, um, one of the interesting things in this particular case study, um, you'll see that there was an external uh, uh, staffer, um, as, you'll, as was reported in Financial Week, that really came to came to uh, find and discover that uh, prior to the uh, opinion being um, issued, um, there were some things that looked odd uh, to the staff auditor. And they raised the question um, to the point it reached a partner level. Um, and this was the response that uh, a partner had given the, uh, had given the uh, staff associate. Um, so you could really, I think, see here the power of culture, um, the power of these concepts of ethics, governance, and culture. Uh, when you see people who um, make statements like this, and you know, I'm a big proponent to say, listen, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with KPMG or any, any big firm. I think you find good people and bad people in every organization. I think when you think about these topics of ethics, governance, and culture, we'd be naive to believe that we don't have a couple of bad seeds within our organizations. Um, this, to me, is completely inappropriate, yet emphasizes the power of what culture can uh, do and the, the essential influence um, that culture has on people's behavior. Um, the staff auditor thought they were doing the right thing, um, but as things got escalated, uh, the message clearly was um, not, not raising this issue. Um, who knows if there was anything further behind um, just pissing off the client, whether there was complicity or not. Um, but again, strong, uh, strong uh, uh, emphasis here on the, that power of, of culture. Uh, another oldie but goodie uh, that most of us probably remember um, is the, the Enron scandal um, of 2001. So this was uh, really, I think, one of the, 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 the big case studies and the big events that were a uh, significant driver of some of the United States uh, legislation, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Um, Ken Lay and Jeff Skilling were the, the masterminds um, behind, this, uh, behind this scandal. Um, if you remember, um, and there was a huge indictment, 53 counts, uh, if you remember when Enron was at its uh, at its peak, uh, some of the things um, that the organization was uh, was participating in, um, and if anyone has had the chance to uh, to watch the the documentary, I think it's called um, the smartest guys in the room. Um, it's the Enron documentary. It's really fascinating, and I think paints some of the uh, really uh, graphically, some of the, the, the major challenges that you have um, with, the note, with the concepts of ethics, governance, and culture in an organization. Um, here you had an organization where the culture was raise the stock price, raise the stock price, raise the stock price. Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, things that just looked funny, uh, when you have such a strong culture of raise the raise our profits, raise our revenues, raise our stock price, um, we had um, uh, Enron traders who were manipulating the uh, uh, supply of energy only to uh, spike prices up. Um, this was, uh, if you remember, during the uh, wildfires. Um, you know they were profiting off of um, these natural disasters, uh, making tons and tons and tons of money. Um, I remember at one point uh, Jeff Skilling, and this really came from the documentary movie, but again emphasizes this power of culture. Um, 
Jeff Skilling had brought back some consultants, and uh, her testimony was when she was having a discussion with Jeff um, about some of the traders on the floor, uh, the notion was, you know, these traders will kill, will kill each other for to make a dollar. Um, and this was just the, 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 the recognized failure in how aggressive uh, of a culture had, had really grown inside of Enron. Um, and as you can, you can see here, it didn't have a very, a very happy ending. Um, when Enron would uh, share its, um, share its uh, earnings reports with analysts, um, <laughs> they were one of the few companies that, that didn't often uh, produce a balance sheet. Um, and one of the, uh, one of the uh, analysts, Richard Grubman, um, when he complained that Enron uh, was, was the only company that could not release a balance sheet along with its earnings statement, uh, Skilling, uh, who was the CEO, CEO of Enron, made this reply. Um, so you, again, you can see highlighted here uh, really the, the, uh, the aspect of culture uh, and the effect it can have um, with, uh, with an organization. Really challenging thing when you have uh, this type of attitude, this type of culture coming from the top. Um, there were frauds that were pervasive all throughout Enron, and again, when you have a, a bad seat at the top, that's one of the most dangerous uh, aspects. It's really uh, uh, a, a telltale sign that the, the ethics, the governance, uh, the cultural uh, system uh, that's in the organization is really at risk for, for failing. Uh, something more recent to the financial crisis, um, Lehman Brothers, um, if you remember, uh, there was a, a host of issues with Lehman Brothers prior to its bankruptcy. Um, you know, one of the you know one of the interesting I think discussions you often get when you talk about these topics are uh, principles versus rules. And the reason I bring this topic up is this uh, this particular article coming from the New York Times talked about uh, one of the ways that Lehman was. Um, essentially uh, misrepresenting its financial position to its investors and stakeholders was by um, using a, uh, a accounting rule, um, we could probably call it an accounting trick, called Repo 105, which enabled them to, um, to move a, a substantial amount of money um, between uh, itself, Lehman, and its um, and its uh, subsidiary. Uh, and the challenge that this caused is from, a, from an accounting perspective, the way that the mechanics of this transaction worked, but the issue became uh, really that while the transaction was purported to be an arm's length transaction, it had this really questionable um, subsidiary uh, type of a relationship with Lehman. Um, the board and executive management team of this organization uh, was heavily uh, stocked with Lehman brother uh, or former Lehman uh, employees. Um, just had a really bad stench of uh, a conflict of interest, and this was just one of the uh, one of the issues that Lehman Brothers had uh, amidst the, um, the the failing financial markets in um, 2000 and. Uh, 2008. So clearly, here it wasn't. It was not an independent business. It appeared to be one. Uh, it was deeply entangled in Lehman. Um, just bad, bad news. Um, if you remember, the president of Lehman Brothers, uh, Richard Fold, uh, Dick Fold. I don't think I have his quote in this uh, particular presentation, but one of the one of his quotes during his testimony um, when it was talking about the sell, uh, the sale of and structuring of um, these collateralized debt obligations, these CDOs that were a big problem in the financial crisis. Um, he had testified that uh, his lawyer, uh, excuse me, had, uh, had indicated that uh, Mr. Fold uh, did not create these transactions, nor was he aware of them. Um, you know, that 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 attitude of um, not knowing, I think, is a, an additional and another big challenge to uh, the topics of ethics, governance, and culture. Uh, when you talk about accountability, when you talk about transparency, responsibility, um, you know, just just trying to um, uh, ignore uh, significant uh, problems or denying them uh, really sets a bad tone uh, 
uh, and of course we can we can see that uh, come to light in the Lehman case as uh, as we all know Lehman is no longer an investment bank um, it uh, declared bankruptcy and is, is no longer um, no longer functioning uh, another investment banking story uh, most of us are probably familiar with this um, is the uh, Goldman Sachs was sued uh, for fraud by the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, in short, uh, Goldman uh, bet against securities here that their, that their internal employees called junk. Uh, that was actually in an email that came, uh, came to light during congressional testimony. Um, one of the, the lead congressional investigators in this matter, uh, Senator Carl Levin, uh, he had challenged uh, Goldman CEO uh, on the conflict of interest issues uh, that essentially uh, were raised in uh, these types of structured products or these again these CDO type deals, um, uh, basically you know speaking to the to the point of how can an organization uh, profit so much by selling a product that their own internal people are calling junk, um, you know, uh, and the the position. Um, interestingly, was that, um, and this is true, is that in certain instances, uh, investment banks do not have a fiduciary duty to a customer or to a client. Um, so uh, that was the defense that DS, that uh, Goldman was using against these fraud charges. Uh, the bottom line was they ended up settling for uh, for five hundred million dollars, um, which was the outcome of this particular uh, this particular case. Uh, let's stop talking about the bad. Let's start looking at ethics getting a little bit better. Um, again, in the context of uh, some of these uh, corporate debacles. Um, computer associates, um, I call this ethics getting better because essentially what uh, computer associates had done, and again, this was a story of a um, rogue um, executive um, who essentially participated in a really large accounting fraud. Uh, it equated to about $2.2 billion. Um, this particular uh, case, and this is why I call this ethics getting better, um, when an organization is undergoing uh, significant investigation uh, by federal agencies, federal government, um, what they could potentially do is basically voluntarily um, uh, execute a deferred prosecution agreement. So a deferred, uh, a DPA is what these agreements are typically called. Um, it's a voluntary alternative to adjudication in which a prosecutor agrees to grant amnesty in exchange for the defendant agreeing to fulfill certain requirements. This typically allows an organization to fix its internal controls. Uh, obviously this was a new leadership team um, that was doing this, uh, and you know the the idea here is you might have a bad person in a good organization, and if new leadership uh, comes in and that bad person is removed from the the corporation, well, the new leadership could very well have an interest in in trying to fix the problems themselves, so to speak. Uh, the bottom line in this story, uh, CA ended up paying. Uh, about 225 million to victimize shareholders. Um, again, ethics getting better from a perspective of, hey, we've recognized as an organization, as a corporation, we've done something wrong. Now we're going to take action, and we're going to, and we're going to fix what uh, uh, what we've done um, in terms of the people that we've harmed. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, ethics gone right. This is uh, one of the closing case studies. And again, I always like to leave things on a positive note. Um, Coke and Pepsi, these are brands that I think all of us are probably uh, very familiar with. Um, and what's really interesting about this story, and again, I think this exemplifies um, just good ethics um, all around. Um, uh, there were some insiders at Coke that were trying to flog off um, their trade secrets to Pepsi. Um, it was just a handful of people internally. Uh, they contacted and they were trying to make uh, uh, offers um, to their competitor, uh, to Coke's competitor, to purchase these secrets. Um, and what's, what's fascinating about this, uh, you know, when Pepsi received these solicitations, what they did as an entity is they actually 
uh, involved the authorities and um, they alerted their competitor, Coke, to what was going on. Um, and the story ended by the two companies working together, uh, setting up a sting operation and ultimately uh, capturing and punishing the, uh, the people that were involved in this, uh, this wrongdoing. Um, so good story of, I think, ethics gone right and, again, um, you know, exemplifying the power of uh, culture in an organization um, uh, in, a, in a positive and a, in a good way. Uh, before we move on, uh, we have, I think, two polling questions coming up. And polling question number two is asking, what high-profile scandal is widely known as the Enron of India? So, Jim, if I could have your help in launching the poll, uh, we will uh, carry on in a minute. It looks like everyone nailed the right answer. Awesome. Awesome. And keep your polling fingers ready. We have a, a third polling question here asking about a DPA agreement. So we're going to launch this in a second, and let's see if we can nail this one. And your choices for this are either true or false. Unfortunately, the question did not fit within the parameters of our webinar software, so I put the ending portion of that where it says, in exchange for the defendant agreeing to fulfill certain requirements. So that is not really an answer choice, but just a supplement to the question. Well, it looks like all of our answers, we have 100% of the vote in. Um, yeah, it looks like we, we uh, confused uh, just a few folks with uh, adding the way we added that supplement. So apologies for that. Um, but the majority of us got this. So the, the answer is true. Um, this is what a deferred prosecution uh, agreement is. Um, good. Looks like the majority of us got that. Uh, again, these are you know these are all um, you know I put these in the bucket of legal governance when uh, it comes to um, how uh, how organizations are interacting with their with their federal their regulatory authorities. Um, this might change uh, depending on what country you live in. Obviously, all legal systems are different, um, but um, in in my experience and as I talk to uh, my international colleagues, typically a lot of the, the fundamentals and principles of these agreements um, to, to an extent can exist uh, in, in, other, in other countries as well. Um, I think it's important for internal auditors to really, you know, again being geographic specific, um, really understand uh, the alternatives um, and, and, and be familiar with some of that regulatory uh, rigor and requirement. Uh, that's specific, that might be specific to your country. Um, and nowadays there's laws that are even overlapping. Um, for example, the UK Bribery Act is, an, is a law that now says if you do business in the UK, um, you know, you're basically within the scope of compliance with, uh, with, their, with their law. Um, so again, I'm not an attorney at law, I'm an auditor in fact. Um, but I think it's important for us to understand some of these uh, basic legal instruments uh, that are that are commonly used uh, when we talk about um, the the whole governance topic. Great. Um, okay. 
next we're going to cover the topic of uh, really understanding the difference and in, in, in getting a better understanding of principles, values, and ethics. Um, when we think of principles, these are the things that are going to inform our choices of values, inform our choices of morals and ethics. Um, when we talk about morals and ethics, um, morals are very individualistic. So every individual person outside of their you know, professional uh, role and their professional position is going to have their own individual moral views. Um, when we talk about ethics, uh, a good way to view ethics is it's the, it's the larger group. It's the uh, acceptable um, um, morals, but for a larger group. So you're speaking, uh, I think, in terms of the collective uh, rather than the individual. Um, so my morals are going to be unique to me. But what's important is as an individual, I have to find, and I, I, I believe that we work best when we affiliate ourselves and we work within organizations that uh, have ethics uh, or espouse to have the type of ethics that are consistent with and uh, in agreement or in align with our morals. Um, but generally speaking, ethics is that collective uh, concept. And the important point here is that this is what informs the choice of, of values. When we talk about values, we're talking about attitude sets that uh, are intended to influence behavior. Um, many organizations will have, uh, will have value statements um, or, or, value, or documents that outline their key values or core values uh, you'll see a lot of times. Um, when you think of the term ethics, and um, the key here is establishing a standard by which behavior can be evaluated as right or wrong. Now, this is going to be different for every organization. As internal auditors, we know that when we audit something, we audit toward a standard, right? Um, so in the context of ethics, we have to understand what is the ethical standard of our organization. Um, if we want to begin to uh, audit uh, the, the condition of our, organ of our organizational culture, right? Audit's very simple. We, we take criteria, the, the what should be, and we, we find the condition, the what, the what is, right? And we compare the two. So the same concept applies when we want to audit ethics. We look at what should be. We look at those criteria or those standards that we write down. And then we have to find ways to look at the what is. Are we really uh, implementing, are we really living up to those standards? And the idea of rightness or wrongness is going to be different for every organization, um, depending on what country you're in. But the, the, the huge opportunity here is the fact that you have the opportunity to set your standards any way you want. Um, ethics are not necessarily influenced by law or regulation. These are self-directed uh, self, uh, standards. This is unique to every organization. I think this is such a powerful concept that we miss. And I think if we ask ourselves the question of, you know, are we living up to our, our ethical standards, um, and how do we prove it? And I think before you even ask yourself that question as an internal auditor, you have to ask the, the precursor question of, do the ethical standards that we have written down, are they really, um, do they really make sense? Do they really support the mission and purpose of our organization. Um, and, and those are good, uh, good uh, I think, a, a good view to have of uh, ethics. And also appreciate the challenges that we have as internal auditors to actually audit this topic. And again, we're going we're gonna to talk through a framework that will hopefully help uh, provide some guidance in this area. Now, taking these three definitions, um, I like the way Paul Chippendale summarizes them uh, it puts them into context. He says values motivate, morals and ethics constrain. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I want to give you an example of that. So we could say as an organization that we want to provide our customers a quality product at a fair price. Right? Well, when it comes time where executive leadership is talking about 
increasing pricing um, within our organization, well, we could say let's double the price. We know that the market is gonna is gonna bear that. Um, we can uh, we have uh, a lot of our customers in contracts. Um, there could be a host of reasons why we believe that we can just dictate higher pricing, increase it by 100 percent, and be able to get it. It's the most profitable option. Um, but the, the the question is is well is that really ethical? You know, if we're espousing to provide our customers a quality product and a, at a fair price, just because we can increase pricing by an exorbitant amount, do we want to? What constrains us from doing that? Well, that's the idea of ethics. So it's again, it's mapping back to these standards that we espouse for our organizations and their rightness or wrongness. So that's a little bit of a primer on putting the principles, values, and ethics into um, into context. Um, I wanted to cover the point of um, ethics in a regulatory context. And um, during, uh, historically, I should say, very rarely um, have we ever seen, and I don't think you really can, legislate ethics, right? You can't force ethics by the creation of law. Um, a CEO I was having a conversation with not too long ago uh, put this best when he said, uh, the law is the lowest rung on the ethics ladder. Um, I got a little bit of a kick out of that, but you really can't create laws around uh, ethics. And, and I think we've tried to do that. This is an example of where we've tried to do that um, as part of Sarbanes-Oxley. You know, in the United States, we've seen um, as part of uh, Section 406, this is not a section you hear about a lot uh, from Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, but it essentially directs the Securities and Exchange Commission um, to adopt rules requiring certain company disclosures. And these company disclosures are around whether or not there is an adopted code of ethics for senior financial officers. And if not, the reasons why. Now, here's what's really, I think, peculiar about the way that this particular law is written. And again, this comes back to, I think, the contention we get when you talk about principle versus the rule. Um, you know, this statement, this law can be interpreted and, you know, frankly has been interpreted by many legal scholars. And I've debated this with them uh, frequently. They say, okay, well, this basically says that if you're not a senior financial officer, if you don't have that designation, um, well, you don't necessarily have to uh, follow a code of ethics. Um, the point is, uh, I don't think that this can really work well. Um, I don't think we've seen it work well. At the end of the day, again, I don't think you can legislate ethics. Um, this is something that's going to be, uh, really has to be driven from the top of the organization uh, at the highest levels. Um, and without that support, I think it's going to be really hard to maintain, uh, to both create and maintain that type of ethical culture uh, that I, I hope you'd want in your organization um, because it can become such an effective governance tool. Um, looking again at the uh, ethics from this regulatory context, um, the, the governance aspects of, um, of the law, so to speak, and again, I always think it's important for internal auditors to understand What's influencing, and, and what's what are the regulators? What's the uh, justice, uh, you know, the justice departments within our country? How are they viewing uh, governance? How are they going to um, validate? How are they going to test to see whether or not um, governance uh, systems are in place to to um, defend and to help us build and, and improve internally? And the reason I like to to point out this. Um, legal guidance is this was after uh, one of the major cases here uh, in the United States where uh, Caremark um, uh, essentially uh, formed, a, there was an opinion formed in this case uh, that talked about um, the fiduciary duties of board members. Okay, and, and I want to keep this simple, but one of the key things that came out of that is this uh, McNulty memo. 
and it, it talks about how do you determine um, whether or not a board has been acting in a fiduciary capacity. How do you know it's been exercising its governance duties effectively? And one of the really key findings that came out of this is that uh, the, the Justice Department, right, so this is going to be, at least in the United States, the department that's going to come and potentially sue your organization um, and, and bring a lawsuit uh, when uh, if you have a corporate governance failure. Um, so one of its key tests was asking uh, if the corporation has established corporate governance mechanisms that can effectively detect and prevent misconduct. Okay. And I think what's really important about this is when we talk about governance, uh, when you talk about uh, the, the, the ethical, the cultural aspects of governance, and you ask this question, how do you really effectively detect and prevent misconduct, um, and are you doing enough? Well, we're going to show some frameworks where I think you can improve upon how you can address that. And regardless if you're in the United States or you're, you're an international organization, um, you know, this fundamental question I think would be asked in most, um, you know, most uh, 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 most instances where um, you're getting uh, adjudicated by an external uh, enforcement agency. You know, the simple question of does your mechanism, right? Does your internal system can it effectively detect and prevent misconduct? Um, it's a basic question. Um, yet it's a question that as uh, when you answer it as an organization you have to be able to demonstrate the proof that you do have these mechanisms in place um, so again uh, we're going to talk about uh, the framework how you can actually uh, build these types of mechanisms to, to, to detect and prevent uh, misconduct these early warning signs um, so hopefully you'll find that useful uh, for your organization When we talk about, um, well, you can read uh, one of, uh, one of uh, Socrates' uh, famous quotes here. Um, and the reason I call this out is I like to say uh, organizations um, act the same way. Uh, when organizations are not uh, completely self-aware, when they don't know what's happening internally, um, they're, they're blind. So I think this... Uh, little quote of wisdom that Socrates had shared um, many, many, many years ago, uh, we can certainly take and we can certainly apply uh, to the corporate structure today. And frankly, uh, one of, the, you know, one of the, the connections that I make when I read this is this is really the function of, of internal audit, uh, serving this role of being a corporate conscience, uh, being self-aware. Uh, helping our organizations become self-aware, uh, certainly within the role of, of uh, internal audit. Um, and if we don't do this or we're not doing it well, uh, we can expect that our organizations will uh, flounder and encounter difficulty. Um, so I think an important uh, emphasis here on how internal audit uh, really can play in a, an imperative role uh, being, uh, being the vehicle, uh, so to speak, uh, to help create that inner transparency, uh, making us uh, very aware of what's happening internal to our organizations. And here we have polling question number four. Um, <clears throat> according to Paul Chippendale, what motivate and, and uh, ethics constrain? So this is a fill-in-the-blank question. Um, please take a minute and populate uh, with what you think the best answer is, and then we'll debrief with the answer. All right, looks like we have 100% of the vote in. And it looks like the majority of us got the correct answer, which is values. Yeah, values motivate, and then morals and ethics are what constrain. 
Good. Uh, any questions coming into our chat box thus far? Again, feel free to send your questions in as you might have them as we go through. Um, uh, the next area that I want to cover is the, the, the topic of governance. And again, feel free to send in chat questions if you have them. Um, and, and I like to start off here by talking about um, what I call the black box of governance. Um, here I have ethics and governance at top, um, meaning that you know the, 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 the tone at the top, the ethics at the top of the organization are certainly going to be uh, permeated throughout the entire organization. Um, here's why I think we have a black box of governance. Um, I think this is particularly true uh, with respect to the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and how the United States responded to um, some of the uh, some of the law. Um, the law clearly sets requirements around um, internal controls over financial reporting. Um, compliance with these controls is required via um, certification statements that have to be signed by senior financial officers. And for since 2002, um, we've witnessed uh, companies doing this uh, in the United States. Uh, organizations around the world have followed suit. And here's what I, what I, what I think, it, or at least view as a, a little bit of a paradox, is Sarbanes-Oxley, while it made us think we're doing a lot better than we are. Um, and I say that, and the reason I have internal control and compliance highlighted here in green is legally we've sort of required now companies to say that they're doing good things, that they have you know, strong controls over financial reporting. And that's, I think, a step in the right direction, but it's given us a false sense of security. We think we're doing this stuff really good, but six to eight years later, what we found is, well, we've had some major corporate governance failures. So what are we missing? Why are these failures key? Why do these failures happen again? Major financial crisis. What happened? Where was Sarbanes-Oxley to save us? We've had two sweeping pieces of legislation uh, in the United States. The, the foremost is Dodd-Frank is now uh, the next uh, major piece of law, um, you know, uh, purported to promote and espouse corporate governance, uh, uh, better corporate governance practices. I don't know if it's going to work, but I think from a, from a sensible perspective, we have to look at, okay, well, we need to really take care and understand governance on our own as an organization and, 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 and try and do better uh, at at governance because this is really the, the 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 starting point for how we manage risk. And I put risk here in, in yellow because I think, you know, from a risk management perspective, I, I think we're we're not green, we're not red, but as a as an industry, as a global marketplace, we're okay at it. We're not that good. I give it a yellow green. Uh, excuse me, a yellow light. Um, I think what we've seen being a red, uh, so to speak. Uh, some of the communication and trust that we see out there. Um, and, and I think this is both between organizations and their respective governments. Uh, I think we see a little of uh, distrust um, between uh, internal employees and their organizations. And this really raises the fundamental question. And again, these are some personal views and in, in, you know, my interpretation of the market. Um, but I think as internal auditors, it should really challenge us to say, well, what state is our corporate culture in? You know, are we demonstrating some of these red, yellow, green areas? Um, do we as an organization really understand what governance means to us? And do we really espouse to uh, implement um, the right type of government uh, governance systems um, to, to promote the type of ethics and culture we want to see in our organization? Um, we're going we're gonna to go through an example of what I call the, the culture, corporate culture index. Um, on how we can maybe measure some of this uh, stuff to find out uh, how well our organizations are um, in, in implementing and executing governance. And I have a, a little theory here is that if we're doing governance well, 
if we're doing governance well, then we should be able to see governance, the effect of governance down here in the culture. And we can do that. And they're not difficult ways to do that. You do it through surveys. You do it through interviews. You do it through um, getting every employee's perspective or the majority of employees' perspectives on what's the culture like. We know we want it to be one way, but really probing and asking and finding out um, how it is, is is part of the challenge. Um, there's two other words here. Uh, that uh, first I'll start with enterprise risk. Most of us have probably heard about enterprise risk management. Um, and, and this is something that as audit practitioners, as risk and compliance practitioners, um, a, a term that makes a lot of sense to us. Um, part of the challenge uh, that I've seen, that I've encountered, is you want to balance um, enterprise risk management with this discovery risk management. Now, what's discovery risk management? Well, this is the, the legal perspective or legal view of if we decide to conduct risk assessments or conduct risk surveys, there's a possibility that these documents and these records can then become discoverable uh, in the in a potential future lawsuit, and th that's a true statement. And I think that you know it's certainly true here in the United States. It very well might be true uh, in other in other countries as well. Um, I, I think the balance that we need, though, is we don't want to be so averse to discovery risk that we don't do the right things when it comes to enterprise risk. We have to conduct those difficult risk assessments. We have to sometimes ask the tough questions. Um, and frankly, we do have an obligation to respond to um, to information we receive that, that might not be favorable for our organization. A good example of this was uh, having a, I had a discussion with a chief auditor not too long ago. And they were looking to audit their, their ethics and their governance system. And they put together a survey, and they asked very specific questions um, regarding the uh, whether or not they felt management, um, uh, whether or not management had um, uh, had any sort of misconduct um, based on their experiences. Um, and I forget exactly how the question was worded, but it was a targeted question asking about management's conduct, for good or for bad. And as the chief auditor began uh, reviewing this and talking with the, the chief legal counsel, um, this idea of discovery risk really uh, prevented or, or at least drove the general counsel to say, we can't ask that question in the organization um, because we have a lot of employees and anything that we find, we're going to have an obligation to follow up. And the long story short is he persuaded the chief auditor to remove the question. Now. I think it's good to get a legal perspective and change you know, your, your work accordingly. But I just question whether or not, and I think the chief auditor really questioned this as well, as was it the right thing to do to remove that question? Um, was it really the right thing to do? Um, because from an enterprise risk perspective, it made a lot of sense to get a candid viewpoint of management's conduct uh, from all employees in the organization. Um, but the, the, the legal risk was the reason that that question was prevented. Um, it's a delicate balance. Um, you definitely want to take into account uh, the legal risks, these discovery risks, but at the same time you don't want to take them into account so much where you're impeded from really taking that uh, deep look into your governance structures, especially when it comes to the culture, and especially when it comes to uh, how management is being viewed by uh, the employees within your organization. So something to keep in mind, something to think about. Um, <clears throat> on this slide, uh, I summarize <clears throat> some of the things that we just talked about. Um, and when we talk about the, the topic of culture, I think you know one of the key challenges here is you know how do you bring that transparency into the culture? Um, many of us have probably heard the the, the word soft controls. Um, you know these are essentially what are going to shape 
uh, our cultural norms within our organizations. And the other important thing is our cultural norms are very much part of defining our risk appetites. Um, a good story I can think of where uh, it was uh, countrywide, if you remember them being uh, under under fire after the financial crisis, um, what was discovered was, um, you know, there were loan officers that were doctoring, you know, cutting and pasting and recopying loan applications um, just to get loans to go through. An enormous amount of risk appetite at the uh, lower level where the mortgage brokers were, uh, were acting. Um, this idea of limited foresight into cultural risks, you know, um, did people at the top of Countrywide know that there was such a pervasive cultural risk in these departments that were, you know, uh, systemically cutting and pasting and forging these applications just to just to make money? Um, you know, right now we have a very limited foresight into into some of these cultural risks, and and there would manifest fraud. There would manifest uh, misconduct in the organization. But again, we're going to walk through a, a framework that hopefully will help uh, each of you address some of these governance challenges. Um, the disclosure speed and flow of risk information, uh, when you think of an organization in terms of how it rolls its risk information up from the board, uh, or to the board, excuse me, um, you know, a lot of times it goes through iterations and iterations. Um, it's slow. Sometimes the process is clunky. Uh, this notion of the information being filtered or distorted. Um, this is a challenge. Uh, this is a challenge with governance. Um, directors have an obligation to get independent information. Um, when directors are only getting their risk information by their chief level executives, um, and they don't have, for example, a, a independent internal audit function, um, I think this risk is really is it's really increased um, that risk information could potentially be filtered and or uh, and or distorted. Um, another, I think, really big issue with governance um, in in the 20th century is this idea of accountability and culpability. Um, in, in terms of you know from the external legal perspective, we have not seen here in the United States. Um, too many uh, real hard-nosed um, uh, sentences for uh, key key players, so to speak, in the financial crisis. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of times uh, the, the the idea of not knowing, um, being ignorant to what was happening internally, um, are are claims that get uh, individual executives off the hook. Um, and really makes their, their company or their former company pay the price. Um, so the idea of accountability, again, it's this term that I think internally, uh, internal auditors need to look at how's the, the organization holding people accountable. Um, we can't expect the law to do it. Um, I think sometimes we, we, we think that they should, um, but they don't do it well. Uh, another interesting statistic about um, lawsuits is that most lawsuits are settled or dismissed anyway. Um, so you really don't have the, um, you know, you really have most of the most of the time these things are just arm wrestling matches to, uh, you know, pay a regulator a big bunch of big lump sum of money. Um, so accountability really needs to be, uh, you know, a, 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 a concept that we we instill in our own organizations uh, by defining what is acceptable, unacceptable behavior, um, and how do we hold hold our people accountable for it. On the topic of governance, um, I wanted to, to share uh, the Institute of Internal Auditors' view of governance in their governance standard. Um, and I just wanted, just wanted to briefly talk about this because this really emphasizes, I think, where internal auditors um, have a role and what they have to assess. And this clearly says um, if you are an organization that espouses to comply with the, the IIA standards, that the internal audit function must assess and make recommendations for improving governance, the governance process. And specifically, it even gets into four categories of governance objectives. Um, and one 
is promoting appropriate ethics and values, things that we've talked about so far. Um, ensuring organizational performance and accountability. Communicating risk information to appropriate areas within the organization. We talked a little bit about uh, making sure that the flow of information wasn't distorted and or filtered. Um, and then coordinating activities as well with uh, key stakeholders. This is the heart of where IA's role is with respect to governance. Um, and I think the, the framework and the tool set that you'll leave with today um, are going to help you be able to build the case that you're meeting and you're complying with this particular, uh, with your, this particular standard. Um, that same standard, uh, the matching implementation standards, go on to say that internal audit must and for those of you that aren't familiar with the IIA standards, um, we actually have some good courses coming up on all the standards. But uh, by way of background, any time you see a must statement, and two, your organization has decided to adopt the IIA standards of practice, um, it's an unconditional requirement. So you have to have, uh, as an internal audit activity, you have to have had evaluated um, your design implementation and effectiveness of your ethics-related objectives, programs, and activities. And this is exactly what uh, part of the learning objectives of today are, and I'm going to show you, you know, how do you really do that? How do you really test effectiveness of ethics? Other than and beyond just looking at a code of ethics and saying, hey, we have one. Um, that is a really poor test um, to demonstrate and to really prove that your ethics-related uh, objectives are, are effective. So let's take a macro view of the governance system. Um, let's break it down to its three simple components, people, process, and technology. Uh, a organization, a, uh, a business entity, um, governance system is made up of these three parts. Now, when I, have, when I, when I typically do this, uh, this presentation, I'm with a live audience, I ask the question of uh, what is the most important aspect of the governance system, if you had to pick one of these, people, process, or technology. And you can answer that uh, on your own. Um, most of the time, 95% of uh, the group will say uh, people. People are the most important aspect of the governance system. Um, then I'll ask the group, uh, if it's a group of internal auditors, where do we spend most of our time auditing? You can answer that question internally on your own. Where's the what what area of the governance system do we spend most of our time auditing? And typically, I get internal auditors to say process. And when I take those two data points, I say, well, what you've told me is you spend most of your time auditing things that are least significant to your organization. And I know that's a harsh way to put it, but it's really there intended only to illustrate a point. Um, that we're probably not doing enough in the area of people. We're probably not doing enough in the area of ethics and culture, and we're probably not doing enough in the areas of uh, what I'm going to call internal adjudication. And we're going to expand upon that concept um, in the rest of this we uh, during the rest of this webinar, but it really is an important concept because this becomes the enforcement mechanism for us to determine whether or not our ethics-related programs and objectives are, in fact, effective. And I think if we're not doing this um, internal adjudication properly, we're never going to be able to, with certainty or with a reasonable level of assurance, say that uh, the ethics and culture within our organization um, are, are part of the solution of risk management uh, and, not part of the, and not part of the problem. a little bit of a funny um, cartoon that I had um, gotten from a colleague of mine. Uh, run this by the legal department, but run super fast so the ethics department doesn't see it. Um, you know, I think um, as a, as a uh, organization, there's three basic governance questions that we need to ask ourselves if we want to uh, make our business decisions um, 
in the benefit of long-term sustainable governance, long-term sustainable operations. And the first question, which I think can typically uh, get answered very simply, is, is the action legal? Um, the, the tougher question is, is it ethical? So not, not only does it comply with the external laws and regulations, but does it, is it consistent with our own internal standards of ethics? Um, that's an important question, and it's going to be the question that's a little bit tougher, I think, for many organizations to, uh, to answer. Um, and the third question is, well, is this sustainable in the long term? And my experience is if you can't say yes to number one and number two, then the sustainability question is going to be a tough one to answer. Um, you can't operate. I guess you can try to operate at the legal minimum, um, but in the absence of having ethics, I think many organizations are going to have a very hard time um, surviving in the in the long term. So some key governance questions there. So where does ethics play in the role of law? Um, this is a, a simple diagram for um, uh, ethics in the context of, of law. Um, this is based on the United States legal system, and there's three important uh, points to take away here um, to get an understanding of the U.S. legal system. One is uh, there's an expression, many of us may have heard it, uh, you're innocent until you're proven guilty. Um, what's interesting, though, is if you actually uh, look at the verdict system, so how the, uh, the legal system will conclude itself, uh, is that um, you're either guilty or you're not guilty. This is the measurement system that's used in the uh, U.S. legal system. Um, as a very astute uh, law student at one of the local law students had pointed out, um, not guilty does not mean innocent. So there's a difference here. As internal auditors, we look at systems. And I think when you look at the legal system and you look at the legal judgments that are made with respect to guilt, there's a whole piece that doesn't get addressed in the legal system. And that piece is very much the opportunity that we have as organizations to address um, the ethical judgment, the ethical aspects of the decisions we make uh, as, an, as an organization. Um, the law is not intended to do it. This is a huge opportunity uh, for us as individual organizations to uh, espouse these ethical standards. Um, and to support this, uh, I'd ask the question, uh, in a, again, a brief survey had about 126 uh, votes um, saying, is it possible to be legally innocent but morally guilty? And many people had indicated, in fact, 96% of the people said yes. And a lot of the comments that are, of course, too voluminous to share in this presentation, where a lot of them alluded to, yes, we see it all the time. You know, we see companies that are getting away with treating people badly, um, and they're getting away with it. They're getting off. Uh, their actions are legal, but they're wrong. Um, so again, really underscores the point of ethics, governance, culture. These are things that uh, we need to espouse internally um, and can't necessarily rely on uh, the, the external um, judgment system, the external legal system uh, to enforce. Um, so what's the benefit of that? Um, well, I wanted to call out some of the uh, systems or some of the differences in the judgment system. We all know, no matter what country that we're in, that legal judgment has external repercussions. Um, uh, internally, we could have an internal judgment system which really addresses our ethical judgment. And this, is, uh, this underscores this concept of what I had called internal adjudication. And I think the fundamental question that we need to ask ourselves right, um, is, do we have uh, the right ethical standards in place so that we can internally measure them and judge the behavior of our own internal employees in an effective and efficient way? Well, what's the difference and what's the benefit of doing this is if you care about your core values of an organization, 
internally, your ethical judgment system is going to measure to these. The external system doesn't care about your core values. You're going to be measured against law or regulation. You can control damage. You can control bad news. You can control wrongdoing if you have a process to internally adjudicate. It's almost like an internal court system, if you will. Um, do you have that system in place to judge behavior? Well, if you don't and the law intervenes, you're going to have externally influenced and adjudicated um, cases. Uh, you can have complete transparency when you're judging uh, the core values, the ethics within your own organization. You don't have that in the external world. It's opaque. 95% of cases uh, are, are, are closed or settled before they reach a verdict. There's no transparency in them. You want that transparency from an ethical perspective. You want to understand what, what's driving behavior in your organization. You want to have the ability to be able to seek restitution from internal folks if they've committed wrongdoing and do so in a quiet manner. The external world, the external legal system, is going to punish those parties, possibly the corporation, as well as create further reputational damages. If you catch wrongdoing, if you catch misconduct before it becomes an egregious fraud, you can address it. You're immune because you've already addressed the issue. It's not going to evolve into a gross uh, fraud or corruption within the organization. Because when it does, and things become the public record, well, there's no longer any immunity um, that you have. So I think this idea of internal adjudication, this idea of ethical, making these ethical judgments in your organization are such an important um, and unchartered territory uh, for many internal audit functions, yet such an essential one uh, that can really be used as a great opportunity uh, for us in the future. <clears throat> so let's do a quick recap and summary here on some of these core terms. Uh, we've covered ethics. These are the rules of conduct recognized in a particular group or culture. The standard of rightness or wrongness, right? We've talked about culture. We've talked about governance. And governance includes a combination of things. The new word that I wanted to introduce here is integrity. Now, if you look at the opposite of integrity, the word that we would find is corruption, right? Corruption is the opposite of integrity. Well, what's integrity? It's the consistency. And this is a key word. And this is a real, I think, important point. If you want to converge ethics, governance, and culture, you have to understand the consistency in which the organization is taking its actions, its values, its methods, its measures, principles, expectations, and outcome. And as a holistic view, it essentially is what judges the quality of a system of the, in its ability to achieve its own goals. So you have to maintain integrity, organizational integrity, if you want to achieve your own goal, um, particularly your goals for the long term. Um, I think that's such an important uh, aspect because what we're going to uh, see shortly here uh, in this framework is Governance and, and, and measuring and ensuring integrity over the long term is really something that um, needs to be uh, needs to be done not just one time but on an ongoing uh, basis. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about culture, and then we're going to get into our uh, our framework for how to converge ethics, governance, and culture, uh, and how to really audit um, uh, ethics and and misconduct. Um, here just summarizes uh, the difference between cultural tones. Uh, when we speak of undertones, what we're talking about are some of the negative uh, type of tones that we might see within our organizations, the overtones really being the more positive cultural tones. Um, you know, I think in some of our case studies we saw, um, you know, we saw a lot of this, the, the, the negative side, um, insatiable appetite for risk. Uh, this is really problematic when you put short-term decision making at the at the expense 
um, of long-term benefit. Uh, I think we saw that underscored in the financial crisis. Um, when you have a very few people in a very autocratic um, type of an environment, uh, self-focused, uh, these are often problematic uh, and can oftentimes lead to negative cultural um, undertones. Um, and then from an overtone perspective, you know, you're really seeing the opposite of these. You know, these are the things that would give you a sense of you have a strong culture. I like this word conscientious employee. Um, you know, if you have a, an environment where your employees are conscious of their behavior, if your employees are uh, conscious for them and, and their coworkers to act responsibly within the, uh, within the value system uh, of the organization, you know, can be such a powerful, uh, powerful tool. Um, when it comes to um, organizational uh, organizational culture. And without further ado, we're going to introduce polling question number five here. And this is asking the consistency of actions, values, methods, measures, principles, expectations, and outcomes best describes what? Integrity, character, ethics, or culture. We got about half the vote in. Looks like we have 100% of our vote in. And it looks like a majority of folks, 83%, uh, selected the right answer, integrity. Yeah. Again, the key word there is the consistency um, of action. Uh, integrity is something that um, you really look at. And I think it's such an appropriate word when you're talking about governance and when you're talking about uh, the ethical and cultural aspects of governance. Because um, you want to have uh, you, you want to have that long term consistency, no doubt about it. Good. Um, one of uh, one of the governance resources that I've used, um, and maybe even you've had an opportunity uh, to find um, other uh, other resources, um, the National Association of Corporate Directors. They're a US-based association. Um, there's a number of corporate governance-related associations um, that, are, uh, uh, that are available. Um, uh, mostly, uh, my experience is these are very country-specific, because you always have different laws in, the, in every country. Um, there are um, uh, a variety of governance frameworks. Um, the NACD uh, has one. Um, there's others that are espoused around the world. I know the King model from South Africa is another good one. Uh, there's a Brazilian model. Um, there's a host of governance frameworks that are out there. I wanted to call out uh, one of the uh, core, uh, core principles in the NACD's framework that you can see highlighted here. Um, and what the NACD had done is they gathered a group of uh, large, um, large pub mainly public companies, um, and they put together what they called the 10 agreed upon principles. And as you can see here, principle number six talks specifically about integrity, ethics, and responsibility. Um, all words that we've seen in the past uh, hour and 40 minutes so far, um, but I think one of the things I wanted to really underscore here, um, it's always, I think, prudent to get um, or baseline your organization against accepted governance frameworks uh, as you pursue this, uh, this, this, uh, this path into uh, exploring your ethics, your governance, and your culture. 
um, and use that as part of your baseline. Use that as part of your uh, criteria, if you will, so that you can uh, gain that uh, assurance that you are, in fact, um, uh, have the right internal uh, processes and structures uh, to substantiate um, these topics. Uh, as you can see here, uh, principle six of the NACD framework um, specifically talks about uh, structures and practices being designed to promote an appropriate corporate culture of integrity, ethics, uh, and social responsibility. Um, so I think the question we need to ask as internal auditors is, well, have we measured and have we assessed this design of our internal uh, structures and practices? Number one, right? That's our first question. And then the second question is going to be, uh, are they operating effectively? Um, so we're going to show you some ways that that you can uh, that you can do that coming up. Um, one of the comment letters to the Securities and Exchange Commission um, was written uh, uh, by Barbara Hackman Franklin. Uh, she is the NACD uh, chairman. Uh, of the NACD board, and one of the uh, one of the quotes that I think really resonates well and just really underscores um, this importance of corporate culture is the viewpoint that a strong corporate culture um, is really going to be one of the best ways um, that a company can uh, combat fraud uh, and its underlying misconduct. Uh, no doubt about that. Um, so, with that being said. Uh, I wanted to spend the rest of the time walking through the big, well, how can we do this? And you know, how do we measure culture? How do we converge these topics of ethics, governance, and culture? Uh, it seems like such a lofty and subjective uh, topic. Um, how do we audit it? What can we do? And that's what I want to talk about next. And the first thing I want to uh, bring up is um, if you had to rate your corporate culture, um, you're going to have to come together with a rating scale. This is an example of one. Um, but the idea here is you have, you know, obviously something that's not good on one side and something that's really good on the other side. Now, I'm going to, for il illustrative purposes, demonstrate and use a 10-point rating scale uh, in my walkthrough of uh, the framework. Um, but I did want to caveat that and say, well, depending on your organization, depending on your own specific, uh, specific needs, um, you can define this rating scale in, in a number of ways. And, you want to really make sure that it's catered and works uh, works well to your organization. Um, the question here is, how do we benchmark our culture? And are we doing trend analysis for our culture? Well, this is intended to be an illustrative example of a culture benchmark. And we all like dashboard information. We all like red, yellow, green. Um, so what is this telling me? And I like to sometimes um, talk about the design and operating effectiveness of a system by looking at the, the end game, so to speak, the, uh, the final output before we talk about the details. So when we talk about cultural benchmarks, I, I say, well, we want to track and trend this over a period of time. You have to build a scale where green is good. You have to build a scale where red is not good. And you have to figure out a way to design your measurement system um, and then benchmark it. So what would you want to benchmark it to? Well, the, the idea here is um, you're going to have some type of aggregate score based on your rating scale um, for your company. And you're going to want to be able to compare your respective or your other uh, business units um, via benchmarking. So what matters to me as a uh, stakeholder in the governance of our organization is identifying uh, and keeping and monitoring um, risky subcultures or, sub or cultures, subcultures that aren't reflective of or deviate from our company standard. And that's what this illustration is intended to depict is at a point in time, you aggregate your uh, culture ratings. And these ratings are merely a function of uh, surveys designed, uh, cultural surveys that uh, ask the questions that your organization think are important. Um, 
and provide it in its own categories. I'll share some examples with you. But the, 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 the simple way to look at this is you develop a cultural survey of key things you want to track and trend over time, and you actually do it. Now, my experience is you don't want to survey people too much. Uh, a quarterly basis is probably most appropriate. Um, but the key is doing it consistently so you can actually track and trend and bring some visibility, some transparency into um, your culture. Um, and again, this is an exercise that has to be uh, surveyed throughout all levels um, and all uh, departments of your organization if you really want to get a big picture uh, governance view of your organization uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to culture. So here, what uh, would concern me is that business unit three is, uh, you know, potentially a, a risky subculture, um, very deviated from the company as a whole, um, a little bit concerning from a from a, a dashboard perspective. Uh, before we carry on, we're going to ask the last polling question, and that polling question is, uh, it's a true or false, and it's whether governance structures uh, and practices should be designed to promote an appropriate corporate culture of integrity, ethics, and corporate social responsibility. And it looks like we got all the votes in and everyone picked true. It's absolutely right. Great job. Um, again, the harder question is how do we assess that design? and how do we uh, test, uh, so to speak, the effectiveness of our corporate culture uh, when, it comes to these, when it comes to these topics. Um, and we're going to carry on. We're going to continue on uh, answering that question. Um, here's a more granular view of that high-level dashboard that you saw. Um, this framework is consistent with a couple of things that uh, I hope we got enlightened to through this, uh, this presentation. One is that focusing on people is such an important aspect of um, governance, ethics, and culture in our organization. Um, number two, uh, it's really so important not to be scared to ask the tough questions, to survey the majority of your people, uh, and, and again, ask those tough questions uh, when it comes to um, behavior and when it comes to culture. In this example, there's eight categories. Um, again, you can divine, define your own categories. In my uh, practice, in my experience, um, I found that these eight are pretty reasonable, discernible chunks um, that, that make sense. You can track them over time. Um, no matter what, uh, you have to do what's right for your organization. Um, each of these categories have only five key core cultural questions that relate to them. Um, again, in this example, we're using scales of uh, uh, 1 to 10. And um, the idea here is being able to uh, conduct those surveys, uh, aggregate what we'll call risk information, and then be able to make conclusions around it. Now, what I would deduct uh, from this particular example is, uh, well, business unit number three isn't really doing too good. Um, this might be that early warning indicator to me that, hey, uh, we might want to get into this area and look at it um, because the uh, there's such a deviation here um, with respect to its score. Um, well, ideally, if you structure your cultural surveys in the right manner, you should be able to drill down into, for example, business unit three and look at your uh, business unit CEO, uh, executive leadership, so to speak, um, and, and be able to, again, get that candid viewpoint of where's the potential uh, opportunities and risk in the culture. And of course, here you see some, again, what are we looking for? We're looking for outliers. We're looking for uh, data points that, um, that that seem a little uh, seem a little odd uh, that deviate from the rest of our scores. Um, the The biggest challenge of this is getting the organization to really uh, want to face that criticism uh, or be prepared to uh, accept 
criticism, uh, constructive criticism, um, you would hope, because you want to be able to have an environment where people want to know when their subordinates and when their uh, when their coworkers um, view them in certain light. Uh, that's really an important aspect of uh, bringing transparency into culture and being able to um, uh, really espouse the the right type of governance that you want within your organization. Um, this is is not rocket science in terms of the technical nature of this. Uh, what's really important is being able to put together uh, the right process so that you can adopt some form of uh, cultural surveying. You might not have to take it down to the individual level. I think in an ideal uh, design, you would be able to take it down to an individual level if you're not ready for it. Um, you know, maybe by business unit would be uh, would be an okay. Uh, you know, compromise uh, if you're finding that your organization is resistant to uh, these types of surveys. Um, here's where I wanted to expand upon this idea of internal adjudication. Um, and one of the questions I often ask internal auditors is, have you recently taken a look at um, what type of uh, misconduct and frauds have happened in your organization over the past um, seven years, ten years, five years, pick a number. Um, and it surprises me that many internal audit functions don't have the level of uh, transparency and visibility into these types of statistics. And that astonishes me because if you believe that people are the uh, one of the most important aspects of good governance and you don't have transparency into determining uh, where there's been misconduct uh, or, or potential fraud in your organization uh, and seeing it in a, in a, a rolled up format um, such as uh, this next slide here. Uh, this is intended to depict uh, uh, you know, an example of uh, reported incidents uh, and cases um, that have been internally adjudicated, that have uh, essentially gone through uh, the organization's internal judgment process to determine whether or not um, valid complaints, uh, how they've resulted and what they've been in violation against. Um, and you'll see here um, broken out into five distinct reporting categories. I'm going to talk about these in, in a little bit more detail um, on our on our uh, previous slide, I'm going to go back to that. But you, you want to have basic information on, OK, uh, how do we measure um, compliance with our code of ethics? Um, how do we measure compliance with the law? And we need transparency in this information. And I think without this, it becomes really hard for internal auditors to provide any assurance as to the governance standard that it's, uh, that it's intended to uh, have the uh, standard 2210. It's a bold standard. I understand that. And I know that it's not an easy thing to do. But the key question here is, what type of transparency do you have into the incidents filed and reported in your organization? Another important question is, well, how timely are reports actually uh, investigated and, and resolved? Um, you know, this is an example dashboard of, you know, what's open, uh, what's under investigation, what's been resolved. Um, some organizations, and I think uh, another metric you might want to look at is, you know, what's the average cycle time to actually take a complaint, investigate it, and bring a conclusion to it? Um, these are all important uh, metrics. Um, I've sometimes found that investigations are opened, and they're opened for years and years and years, and they're they're never closed. It's like, you know, this there, there's allegations of misconduct. There's this ongoing perpetual investigation. I think that can ultimately be very detrimental to the organization. Um, and, and lastly, looking at reporting resolution. You know, what was the outcome of a particular investigation? Was there an authority change? Was there disciplinary action? Was there some type of prosecution the organization took against the uh, perpetrator? Uh, was there some type of restitution that was um, that was allowed? Uh, or that occurred within the organization? And wh what business unit did these ac actions take place in? Um, so the idea here, and again, this is an illustrative example of what transparency do you have into your incident reporting? Um, 
I have found a lot of organizations wait until um, they get a false sense of security. And I'll be candid with you and share, you know, discussions I've had with chief auditors where I'll ask that question of, hey, um, you know, how do you, uh, how does your um, reporting line, uh, how do you use that information? And I get answers like, oh, there's nothing good that comes through there. It's just people that are complaining to HR or, you know, they're, they're, they're not significant or we don't hear anything. And it gives you a false sense of security because you think now that everything's okay because you don't hear about these incidents. I'm of the school of thought that says if you don't have any incidents that are getting reported, it's probably less a function of your organization being perfect and probably more of a function of you probably don't have the right reporting process in place, one. And two, um, the right workflow or the right process for internal adjudication. And this is a really important concept because, um, one, I think it's incumbent upon us as internal auditors to understand uh, when we do get reports, where are the business issues? Um, and determine whether or not we have business issues or assess how the organization is uh, making conclusions as to whether or not we have business issues before we raise this to asking the question, is it a legal issue? Um, and I think this is so important because we might find that uh, every, uh, all uh, legal issues are business issues, right? It's always going to create some effect to our business. But not every business issue is a legal issue. And I think it's important for us uh, when we talk about internal adjudication, if, some, if an individual's actions or an individual's um, behavior gets called into question before we allege that anything is illegal, before we allege that there's a gross violation of some uh, regulatory rule, the first thing we should be doing if we want to espouse the right ethics governance and culture in our organization is making an internal judgment as to is our code of conduct violated. If there's a professional standard, uh, you might want to include that as well. Um, or is a company policy been violated? These are business issues. These are things that don't take uh, lots of lawyers or shouldn't take lots of lawyers and years of investigation to make an opinion about or make a judgment about. And if we do this well, there will be circumstances, cir circumstances where things might have to get referred to the lawyers um, to look and determine whether or not there's been regulation or uh, law that's been broken. Um, but if you want to sustain, if you're a believer in culture, if you're a believer in governance, and you really want to do what's in the best interest of your organization for the long term, I think it's really important here to make sure you're, you're segregating out is the business issues, the code of conduct issues, the company policy issues. Um, and, and typically, and again, this is a generic workflow, but you might see some of the parties involved in this type of a review and approval process, so to speak. Um, you know, you definitely want to get your lawyers involved if there's regulatory or legal issues. Um, the challenge that I see when people immediately want to judge behavior to the law is you lose the benefit of determining whether or not that behavior was consistent with the organization's culture, which are these issues up here. Um, so think about that in your own design um, and ask yourself that question. Is are you, uh, do you have that internal enforcement mechanism or as I put it before, that internal ethics compliance system um, as you see here and what are you doing about it? And this is the way you can be preventive in nature. If you really want to want to promote the right type of culture, if you really want to catch things in their early stages, um, you want to catch that misconduct before it becomes a gross violation of law. You want to catch that deviation to uh, company policy before it becomes this gross violation of regulation. So that's sort of the, the principle behind why it's so important to not only have that internal adjudication process in place, but be able to discern between business issues and legal issues um, as part of that uh, compliance system, so to speak. Um, so hopefully that's been helpful um, because this is, it's a heck of a lot easier said than done, but when this is done well, you can really master and I think you can really have that transparency that you need um, to get 
uh, and provide those assurances uh, around these, these key topics of ethics, governance, and culture uh, within your organization. And uh, one of the last things I like to end with here, because um, I know we're just about out of time, um, and again, every organization is going to be unique when it talks about its values and its, its, its principles and uh, how these um, uh, aspirations are laid out. Um, one of the, the, the organizations that I've always found just to be a, an excellent example um, and really uh, been an organization built on just strong principles um, is the company J.C. Penney. They're a retailer that started um, in the United States uh, by James uh, Penny, uh, James, uh, yeah, James uh, uh, Cash Penny uh, was his uh, was his name. Um, and these principles were a function of his first five stores. And uh, for those of you that might not be familiar with J.C. Penney's, they're now a you know a, a large entity with thousands of stores. But the first five stores uh, that were ever created. He pulled together as president of the company all of his management uh, of all the retail stores and they came up with what they called the penny idea and this organization uh, well over uh, actually just about a hundred years later um, is still doing well it's still thriving it's still successful and while I know uh, recognizing the return on investment when you talk about initiatives uh, with respect to ethics, governance, and culture is sometimes a very hard thing to do. Um, here's a good example of 100 years later of how that value's been harnessed. So uh, I know we're just about out of time here, um, but I did want to stay on, or I will stay on, uh, if anyone has any additional questions. I uh, really want to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. Um, and uh, hopefully you got something, hopefully you uh, got a new fresh perspective, you gained a little insight here. Um, fresh perspective means a lot when you're talking about these topics uh, and trying to implement uh, auditing programs around them and gaining assurance around them. So hopefully you learned something. Uh, if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, without further ado, Jim, let me pass things back to you. And again, I'll hang on afterwards if anyone has any questions. Thank you again. Well, thank you, Michael. This has been great. Uh, it's been a, a great topic, a great webinar, and I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, remember, if you do have any questions, feel free to, uh, to submit them, uh, either Mike or I. You can send them to me, and I'll forward them on to Mike, or you can send them directly to Mike. And uh, just thank you all for, for being with us today, and thank you, Mike, for putting on this great presentation. Uh, just as a reminder, the purpose of our Training Without Travel webinar is to provide you with high-quality, low-cost, online alternative training solutions covering timely topics with value-added resources and tools that you can use in your job. We bring the world's best subject matter experts directly to your desktop with timely information. Our next webinar coming up, uh, we actually, it's a two-part webinar. It's the IIA standards coming up on March the 5th and March the 12th. Is that correct, Mike? Uh, that sounds right, Jim. I think it's a great opportunity for, uh, if you're an internal audit shop looking to evaluate your internal culture, uh, it'll be a great program to attend. And please feel free to share uh, the information. You can find the information to, uh, uh, to sign up for these webinars on the AuditNet website. And we are promoting the, uh, uh, the group rate, which is a great bargain of uh, $300 for uh, each one of the webinars, and everybody in your department can attend, earn CPE. So, you know, earn that CPE early in the year. You don't have to scramble at the end of the year to, uh, to pull things together. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll close it off and say again, thank you, Mike, for, uh, uh, for putting this webinar on today. It's, uh, it's been a great opportunity and a, a very important topic for everybody, uh, especially internal auditors. So uh, thank you all. Have a great day, everyone.